All right, thank you. Um, and thanks for doing the countdown for me, uh, Joe. So uh, good to be with you all for um, a topic that um, is uh, pretty new uh, in this world of um, helping professions. Uh, and that is about political stress um, and the struggles that we're having both uh, personally, interpersonally, and as a society. So um, um, I'm, I'm happy to be doing this. And I'm going to have a, a, a PowerPoint uh, that I'm going to call up now. Uh, and uh, I'll walk you through what we're going to do first, and then we will get going. So therapy in a time of political stress and polarization. So these are two words, political stress, polarization, that were not uh, part of my training many years ago as a therapist, but they certainly are with us now. Uh, and so I am going to, let's see, we have the, uh, the chat, it kind of interferes with my, the location of my uh, slides here. So hopefully this will work out for us. Okay, so here's the overview. Uh, the political polar, I'm gonna talk first about political polarization uh, and then the um, effects on family and other social bonds. Um, then I'm gonna talk about clinical assessment issues for pairs who are divided by politics, family pairs, mostly it could, it could be good friend pairs as well. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about treatment issues uh, and then a community outreach uh, and particularly through a nonprofit I helped to found called Braver Angels, which is gone national and is devoted to depolarizing America. So as we go through this, um, I'm going to be uh, forwarding some slides. And what I've learned already is that if you're chatting, it covers the little place on the screen like right now. So Joe, when you just chatted out, uh, I can't move my slide. <laughs> so, okay. So hopefully this will work for us here. All right. So the challenge of polarization, we have historic levels of political polarization in this country right now. Um, a lot of historians say we are more divided now than we've been at any time since the 1850s. And we know what happened there after the 1850s. And this is not just, <clears throat> or even mainly polarization on issues, uh, left or right, liberal conservative, but what the political scientists and psychologists are calling social or affective polarization, how we feel about each other, how we relate to each other, uh, that's characterized by three main factors. Othering, seeing people who differ from us politically as essentially different or alien from us. They are, I don't understand those people. So I invite you to think about um, um, how many times you, you've said or thought or other people in your life, I don't understand those people. I don't get them at all. Where the heck are they coming from? How could they possibly vote for so-and-so? So, -and -so? so these, are, these are very different human beings, okay? They're other. Uh, the second is aversion, and that is uh, holding dislike or distrust for them. I don't like them, so I don't understand them, I don't get them, and I don't like them. And the third is moralizing, of uh, seeing people who, uh, who think and act politically differently as bad people. Now, I'm not talking about here, this, this is not primarily about some politicians or some extremists. Um, uh, we're talking about how people feel about the 70 plus million people um, who voted the other way in an election. And, and uh, to give an example of, of this, a, a kind of a data point here, um, in 1960, 5% of Americans said that they would be uncomfortable with their son or daughter marrying somebody of the other political party. But that has gone up to 40 to 45% of Americans who are saying to the pollsters that they would be uncomfortable with an inter-party marriage. Now, it's not that we've become intolerant in every possible way since 1960. In fact, the, the, uh, the, the valuations or the attitudes that people have towards interracial marriage have gone the other direction. You know, 30, 40% of Americans 1960 were at least were willing to admit that they were uncomfortable with an interracial marriage, that's going down to five or 10%, at least you know, people are willing to admit that. So <clears throat> we've become more tolerant in some ways, but inter-party, 
that's become really quite different. And so this polarization has entered nearly every sector of life, of family, work, civic organizations, colleges, universities, it is everywhere. And uh, presumably that's one of the reasons why you run this call. And I, I ought to say, we're in the middle of this ourselves. Uh, this is not a, you know, a clinical presentation about problems somebody else has that some of us want to help with. We are all involved, we are embedded in this. And let me also say that one of the challenges for most people in the helping professions of uh, you know, social work, uh, uh, various forms of, of counseling practice and so on, is that most people who go into the kind of work that we're in are what I call blue, they're more liberal. Um, in this last election, they voted for Joe Biden or third party candidate who was on the left or something like that. They mostly did not vote for President Trump. So we have our own issues in terms of working with people. Uh, many of us, uh, if we are on the more blue side. And if you're a red, if you're conservative, oh boy, uh, are you likely to feel not only some alienation from others, maybe in your family, your friendship circle, but you may feel deeply alienated from your uh, profession and your colleagues. In fact, you may not even want to be outing yourself as a conservative. So what I'm saying is that these issues of polarization are part of our society, <clears throat> they're part of our families, our work, and they're also a part of our professions. Now, we could have a, a long conversation about the sources of this polarization. I just wanna say a couple of things here, not, not on a slide. It's been rising for uh, at least 30 years, so it's not a matter of the last election or you know, the, the former president. It's happening in other countries, think of Great Britain, <clears throat> Brexit. Uh, it's happening in many other countries in the world. Um, and it's driven by a lot of forces, uh, some of which are new, like social media, some of which have been around for some time, like gerrymandering, which has gotten worse. Um, we have much more <clears throat> media silos. We get our information from very different places. Uh, we have more big money in politics. Um, we just have a more uh, fractious society. So lo lots of things that have gone into it, but I wanna, I'm just emphasizing <clears throat> um, the multiple sources uh, and this is happening in other countries of the world, just so uh, we don't think of this more narrowly <clears throat> as the, the other political party is, uh, is causing this. So let's try to avoid the kind of othering as we go through our own presentation here today. <clears throat> so social networks are coping uh, with uh, political stress. Uh, it's invaded couple relationships. So I'm a marriage and family therapist by training work a lot with couples as well as families. And, um, and I'm gonna be emphasizing some of that here. <clears throat> so it's a made a couple of relationships, family life, other important relationships in unprecedented ways. I have never, I've practiced for decades, I've never had people threaten divorce over who they vote for. I've never had family cutoffs. Uh, people saying you're no longer my mother, you're no longer my father, you're no longer my son, no longer my daughter um, over, over politics and who they voted for. And some of the reason for that is that politics has become part of our core values and our personal identity. And so in this organization, I'll be describing Braver Angels, we, we, we use the terms red and blue, uh, red more, lean more conservative, tend to vote more for Republicans, blue, lean more liberal, tend to vote for more Democrats. Um, and, and these have become, uh, according to the political scientists, part of our identity not just uh, <clears throat> some article of clothing we take on or off, but part of who we are. And, and you can see neighborhoods cluster around that, cities, uh, towns cluster around this political identity. <clears throat> so the, the, the challenge for these close relationships is that if the political other is seen as not just wrong, but as deluded at best or evil or abetting evil at worst, then what if that other is a loved one? Okay, so if I demonize the 70 million people who vote, who vote differently, and I watch my own siloed uh, TV and uh, have my own Facebook uh, uh, channels, <clears throat> uh, what do I do with the fact <clears throat> that people that I love, that I've been friends with since uh, you know, first grade, 
um, that they are part of that other. How do I deal with that? How do we deal with that with each other? And then blues in particular, so people on the more liberal side, this is my observation now, I don't have data on this one, but blues in particular seem to be struggling if they are married to or partnered with a Trump supporting red. So that the, the cases I've dealt with and have been consulted on and heard about when, uh, when somebody is, is highly distressed in the relationship over voting <clears throat> it's been primarily uh, blues uh, who who may have been uh, married or partnered for decades uh, to a red uh, once uh, donald trump came along um, that became uh, a kind of a litmus test so uh, so blues in particular i think in family life are having some challenges not the red zone as well i don't want to I don't want to make it uh, either or, but that's that's what I've observed. The blues are are struggling more <clears throat> with how to accept uh, loved ones who are red, and the reds are feeling that, by the way. <clears throat> so here are some uh, assessment uh, issues uh, for couples and family pairs who are divided by politics. Uh, so first question: <clears throat> Are there political differences, longstanding or recent? Um, and if recent, why now? So I referred to couples where they lived fine with one being more of a Democrat, one more Republican. Um, and, uh, and it's really after Donald Trump came along that the divisions really uh, became problematic. <clears throat> or did they fight all along about this? So that's an important, that's an important factor. Um, second is in terms of assessment, <clears throat> Is this one of many differences they have conflict over, or is it more singular? <clears throat> so if they have many uh, conflicts, uh, this may be just one that is rising to the surface now because of this the polarized environment. Um, and um, it may serve you know, just uh, other purposes in their relationship <clears throat> if they have a lot of underlying uh, conflict and tension, or is it more singular? Um, are they arguing a lot, occasionally, or keeping a brooding silence about politics? So what, uh, what family members uh, tend to do, they, they may, they may um, um, you know, turn the TV on, somebody reads a paper, <clears throat> and they're arguing about this a lot. Uh, it may just flare occasionally, but be toxic when it does. Or they're keeping silent, but not in an agreed upon way. Not in a way that says, "Okay, we differ in this area. You know, let's let's not let it come between us. We will, you know, go about our lives, but we will. We've agreed we're not going to be talking much about politics." The third, the third situation, they're probably working it out. <clears throat> they're not bringing this to you, but there are other couples. So <clears throat> I'm going to be um, uh, on June first. I'm going to be doing a, a national first of a series of what national webinars. Uh, where I'm going to have a couple um, who um, have volunteered uh, to be interviewed and hopefully helped uh, about their political differences uh, in front of a live webinar audience. <clears throat> and what I've learned so far about them is that uh, she's a blue, he's a red. It wasn't such a big different issue for them uh, until Trump came along. Um, and um, the, the husband would just as soon not talk about this, but his wife comes home from work uh, and she really wants to talk about what she's heard about the news of the day. And um, he doesn't want to engage, but then he does engage and then they argue. Um, so th that, that's this particular, that's an example. <clears throat> now, a key assessment issue is if one of them is on the brink with a difference, that is the threatening divorce, a breakup, a cutoff, if somebody is uh, at, the, at the edge of whether they can stay in the relationship, this is a very important thing uh, to bear in mind. Uh, the, um, the couple that I'm gonna be doing the webinar with uh, are not at that, at, at that stage. But if somebody is at that stage, you have much more of a kind of a, a emergency, a much more kind of a crisis intervention. So those are some initial assessment um, issues. <clears throat> uh, some more. Are the third parties involved? <clears throat> so it's not uncommon if a pair 
in a family, and they may be an adult child um, uh, and the parent, they could be siblings, um, you know, any, any number, I'm thinking about pairs here, <clears throat> um, it's, it's the, usually there are other people in the family who are part of taking sides. Um, I'm gonna show you a video in a, in a bit of a mother, uh, adult daughter, and you'll hear the mother say at the beginning that her two sons are conservative like she is, and her daughter is the one that has become the outlier. <clears throat> so when the third party's involved, you get all these kind of uh, triangles and coalitions that really complicate things that you need to be finding out about. Um, next is who's, who is the main initiator of the conflicted conversations and how do they bring it up? <clears throat> so I have learned just from the paperwork so far that the couple I'm gonna be seeing soon, um, um, she brings it up, I don't know how. Um, uh, for the, the couple, you're, the mother-daughter, you're going to see uh, on, the, on the interview, um, one of the things I learned about them is that the mother often brings it up, okay, or sometimes the daughter. So who brings it up? How do they bring it up? How does the other one respond? And how do they engage in the conversation? So in all my clinical counseling work, I like to, I like to find out what the, what the landscape is, uh, or what people are struggling with, how they're feeling about it, and so on. And then I like to create, I like to know what the particular scenes are, S-C-E-N-E, -E. um, uh, just drilling down who brings this stuff up, how do they bring it up, how does the other respond? Because <clears throat> what, we, what I know from working with couples for all these years, and there's research to support this, that most toxic conflicts go badly <clears throat> within the first three moves. So if you want to think of like as tennis, there's a serve, return of serve, and then a volley back. <clears throat> Most of the time when things are going to go badly, they, it's, it, it's, it's in those first three moves. So if you're working with people who are having very negative conflict uh, over politics, you try to figure out, you try to learn how they are beginning, how the other person responds, and then how the original, uh, the, the initiator responds. Um, and then, so this, this is what I call mapping out a common scene, the interactional context and the sequence. <clears throat> so I just uh, yesterday met with <clears throat> the adult children and spouses um, of a, a family uh, whose mother, or the mother has gotten involved in a QAnon type organizations uh, and is uh, an evangelist for, um, in their mind, right wing conspiracies it's created quite a negative pattern in the family, including the grandchildren are around for this. Uh, and so part of what I did uh, in my initial consultation with the adult kids was to go, go deeper than what are, what's, what's mom saying or how these things end, uh, but how do they begin and, and, and how do people respond? So those are some important assessment issues uh, when, when the politics are, are involved in conflict. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you a, um, a uh, maybe a two and a half or three minute video <clears throat> of a mother and daughter. Um, this was right after President Trump was elected in 2016. Uh, and, um, and I don't know if he had taken office yet, but it was in that area, maybe he had taken office. Uh, the, the New York Times um, um, found a number of family pairs. These were uh, adult kids uh, and their parents who differed politically and who would be willing to have uh, 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 their telephone calls uh, videotaped. So here we have the daughter, I believe, is in New York. <clears throat> Mother is in California. Uh, and uh, there is a camera crew in each of their places and you're gonna see them on the phone with each other. And so I'd like you to look at this in terms of the assessment ideas that I just talked about. <clears throat> so I, I, I'm encouraging you to um, not get caught up in the content of this, not caught up in a, you know, who do you agree with and who makes a good point and who gets a good zinger in there, uh, or just get into you're like, you kidding me? Uh, uh, how could somebody uh, how could somebody think that way about politics? So I'd like to urge you, I mean, you'll have those feelings, but I'd like to urge you to look at the interpersonal communication and the challenges that that's presenting for them. And imagine <clears throat> that, say, if the adult daughter came to you for counseling, um, how you might counsel her. Um, so it, it could be helpful to watch the video thinking that she, she could be your client. Okay, so now what I'm going to do 
uh, is uh, is switch to the another PowerPoint here that will allow me to do. Um, is from Kentucky. She's lived in Los Angeles for 20, 21 years. Tiffany and I have a very good relationship, except for politics. I have two sons that are conservative, like mom. And then I have my daughter, who's a liberal. I'm a public school teacher. I teach social studies, high school. As much as I kept telling myself that I lost respect for every single Trump supporter, when it comes to your mom, it's a different story. It's sad to me that my family that I love so much has voted for someone that I have not an ounce of respect for, and I actually think is like the Antichrist. I mean, that might sound dramatic to you, but Wait, it's, it's really how I feel. I it's didn't hear the last thing you said. It's the what end of something? I said, I think he's the Antichrist. I really do. I really oh, do. Okay, well, I felt that way about Obama. So, you know, we're both coming from different directions. I feel that my rights and other Christians' rights are being taken away slowly. Okay. And you know Trump is not a Christian, right? No, he is. Because your brother went on a website and found this site that said Christ, um, Trump had become a Christian, that um, he did not want it to get out because people would think he was just doing that for the election. Separation of church and state means nothing to you? The fact you that the, the country is not Christian for the last six months before the election. This is what I pray. And this is what millions, I'm sure, of other Americans pray. I for don't Trump? know who's telling you. I prayed for who. Trump. Will you wait for a minute? Yes, I did. I say, God, I don't know who's telling the truth and who's lying. But you do. Please help the person that can lead this country the best get elected. Mm -hmm. Well, God has a funny sense of humor. Well, evidently God thinks he'll do a good job. Do what upsets he'll do me a good is, job? Let's, let's leave God out. What of upsets it. me, Tiffany, is you guys, liberals, wait, wait, wait. Are not can you, can you actually, giving, wait, 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 wait. You're not wait, giving can you, Trump a chance. Do you have the same hopes for the future that I do? I just want to survive the next four years, Mom, so probably not. I can promise you one thing. Oh, please do. You will survive the next four years. I will survive because I'm a middle class white woman who has a college degree and like parents who love me and are financially stable. But what about the people who don't have that? I mean, I'm straight. I don't got to worry about being able to marry the person I love. You know what I mean, mom? Baby, I can promise you it's going to be okay. Can you though? Yeah, I really can. When we catch ourselves getting heated, we should just take a breath. And remember that we love each other very much. And we can yes. have a civil conversation because this is what we need to do in this country in general. But and not we can't let the men get involved because they don't do that. All right, baby. I love you. I love you so much. I see you Saturday. And I'm so excited. Me too, baby. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Okay. Oh. Sorry, I know I squeaked a couple of times. <laughs> My daughter just make a lot of water rock. Okay. They are a fun pair. So I'm going to go back to this PowerPoint. And uh, another little feature of this one is you have to start all over when you, uh, when you, um, um, stop it. <clears throat> so um, if we were doing an interactive uh, conversation now, I would be asking you for your comments uh, about what you saw. Um, and uh, hopefully what I talked about in terms of assessment will uh, be kind of clear to you um, <clears throat> how their conversations flare, um, how they kind of uh, stop listening, uh, snipe at each other, generalize, and so on. Um, and um, and I actually had the chance to do um, a follow up with them, um, and I hope that video will be uh, available at some point. But I did an hour uh, with them uh, um, about uh, six months ago for a Dutch documentary a film crew, uh, in which I offered some perspective to them 
about how they um, could manage these, these, uh, these differences. Uh, but you saw that there's an underlying uh, love and affection for each other. You saw that at the end. Uh, but you also saw a lot, lots of not very functional uh, communication. Um, okay, so onward to uh, treatment issues. <clears throat> uh, so one of the most important things you can do with uh, loved ones uh, who are divided by politics <clears throat> is to try to elicit commonality and values underneath their political differences. And so for example, for this um, uh, mom and her daughter, they both really do care about politics. They do care about who's in office. They do care about what's uh, going on in the country. <clears throat> they have different ideas about the sources of the problems, what to do. And um, the parents uh, sent their daughter um, uh, to a very liberal uh, college uh, that she wanted to go to and that they had every reason to believe she would become more liberal from, but it was the right college for her. Um, she really wanted to go uh, and they supported her. Um, and when I, when I um, uh, interviewed them, this was something that really came out, okay? That, um, uh, that she did feel, although they differed about politics, she did feel an overall support for her pursuing um, her own values. Um, the second is thing to work on differentiation and boundaries. And so a lot of this work, uh, when you're working with, with people, family members of politics, is, is about differentiation of self and about boundaries. <clears throat> uh, the idea being here that each person is entitled to their own political beliefs. Now, how they behave or how they come across to you or whatever is, is, is a different matter. But <clears throat> um, a, a climate family systems approach to this uh, issue would say that if um, I can't hold on to my equilibrium, over my partners, my family members, believing something different than I do, that's usually a differentiation of self issue. That I am churned up because of what you believe or who you vote for. Again, that's different from if you're being antagonistic kind of coming across to me and, and you know, putting me down. Well, that, that's, that's another matter of, of preserving my own boundaries. Um, but in, in the case of, of, of Tiffany and her mom, Sally, a, a big part of what I worked with them on in my consultation was that Tiffany, and you heard her say this early in the interview, um, is she just can't stand the idea of people voting for Trump. And the fact that her family members, the people she loves that much, it just agitated her. It agitated her. She suffered over the fact that they voted for Trump. So then when she would talk to her mom, she would come on in such a way. As to, as to say there's something wrong with you because you voted for Trump. And ultimately she's saying, I can't, I can't have peace in my heart, in my soul, <clears throat> um, if, if you think this differently. So a lot of it is that kind of, of differentiation uh, that, um, and so we, we have a workshop in this Braver Angels organization that I'll talk about uh, in a minute on families and politics. <clears throat> and we talk about the prime directive, the prime directive is do not try to change another family member. You can only change yourself. And this would apply to friends and loved ones and people you care about. That if you set out to try to change them, to fix their politics, <clears throat> you're going to end up hurting yourself in the relationship. In fact, we know from social psychology research <clears throat> that if, if you come on strong, what, what about how wrong the other person is <clears throat> in their values, <clears throat> in their facts, what people tend to do is to drill down even more. And again, I want to distinguish between somebody's beliefs, even though I disagree with them, even, I could even be appalled, and how they behave towards me, okay? So I'm not suggesting complete tolerance for people uh, in trying to roughshod over me or the family, but I'm talking about um, uh, my disequilibrium about them being on the other political side. So some more treatment issues. 
help them identify and shift the coercive you're wrong, no, I'm wrong exchanges that are usually what create the antagonism. So you saw that with, with Tiffany and her mom, Sally. <clears throat> um, the tit for tat, the, the interruptions, the um, all you liberals, oh, you know, stop calling me, calling me just all you liberals. Um, uh, you know, you say up, I say down, you say left, I say right. Uh, these are coercive loops that people get into uh, that create the antagonism. Um, and you can help them break those coercive loops um, and help them communicate more um, effectively and respectfully. Um, if they can't manage political conversations, then some people can. <clears throat> See if they can agree to eliminate them for the sake of the relationship. And the key is to do this with equanimity rather than resentment. It's okay to say, <clears throat> this isn't something we can handle. And we're agreeing for the sake of us and that we're not going to go there. And one of the things I say to people is, do you want politicians political leaders, political parties hurting your relationship. That you, we all have the ability to keep that from hurting us. And if what that means is that we uh, decide uh, to, um, to eliminate or cut down on certain conversations, well, we can't handle it right now. And notice it's the we now, not like, you know, you're so irrational, I can't talk to you anymore. Uh, and then externalize the problem. <clears throat> this is what I just referred to by asking whether they want to allow political parties and politicians to hurt the marriage, to hurt the family. So this is called externalizing the problem, if you will. <clears throat> we are, you can help people see that we are in a polarized, highly rhetorical, divisive world. Uh, and, uh, and, and you could be on social media with family members and you have to decide whether to let the stuff that your relative is sharing on social media hurt your relationship with that relative. Uh, or you can do things uh, like my, my daughter tells me you can do on Facebook. You can, um, the, you can uh, block the, the, the external shares that somebody in your family does. They get you all worked up. So we can do things to keep politics from hurting our relationships. And then finally, under treatment, <clears throat> But sometimes it's helpful to talk with the more upset partner alone to help them do a couple of things. One is to differentiate their anger at a political party and its leaders from their spouse who supports them and to decide if they want to blow up their marriage or their parent-child relationship over this difference. <clears throat> um, uh, and so I see this, <clears throat> I saw this a lot during the, the Trump's administration. Um, and I, I saw blues who can't get at Trump much as they would like to, uh, identifying a family member, a loved one, as if that person is Trump because that person supports Trump. And all of their anger at, uh, at Trump, at his party, who they can't get at, comes out on this person in front of me. And what I've learned is that there are lots of reasons why people support different candidates and not. But if you just see them as a stereotype, as you see them as e equivalent to that person you don't like, then they become a cardboard character and we feel free to take out our anger and frustration on them. So that's, these are things you can help people do. And then the last one is, is it worth blowing up? Is it worth losing a friendship over this? Is it worth, uh, um, is it worth a, a family cutoff? So uh, I want to shift now to this braver angels work. Um, I, um, right after the presidential election in 2016, you all remember it well, I'm sure. About two weeks later, a colleague of mine from New York, David Blankenhorn, uh, called me and said he had been on the phone with another colleague, uh, uh, David uh, Lapp, who lives in Southwest Ohio, and they've been comparing notes about how people in the Upper East Side of Manhattan were feeling about the election and people in, um, in Southwest Ohio, and they were different planets, okay? Um, uh, um, in, it, it was funeral, funeral time in Manhattan, and it was uh, hope and change uh, in Southwest Ohio. And they decided uh, really on the spur of the moment in that call to get 10 Hillary Clinton voters and 10 Donald Trump voters together for a half an hour, excuse me, for <laughs> 13 hours over a weekend in Southwest Ohio um, in December, 2016, uh, to see if they could talk to each other. Uh, and they called me and I said, oh, that's pretty brave. What were you thinking of doing with them? 
And they said they weren't sure, but they asked me if I could help figure that out. And so I did uh, and flew to Ohio and we had a very powerful weekend together with these, these, these folks uh, from Southwest Ohio. Uh, and that launched um, what's become a national nonprofit and movement called Braver Angels. Uh, it used to be called Better Angels for the Na Lincoln phrase of Better Angels of Our Nature. And then in this litigious society, we got sued by the people who owned the Better Angels. So we switched to Braver Angels and we're, we're happy with that. So our mission is a citizens organization uniting red and blue Americans in a working alliance to depolarize America. As individuals, we try to understand the other side's point of view, even if we don't agree with it. As in our communities, we engage with those we disagree with looking for common ground and ways to work together. And in politics, we support principles that bring us together rather than divide us. So what I'm now switching to is I've talked about the clinical and counseling part. Now I'm gonna talk about, if you will, the kind of marriage counseling for the country. So we have a variety of workshops. We've done a thousand of these across the country in the last four years. Uh, we have red, blue workshops. I'm gonna show you what one of those look like where you have seven reds, seven blues come together for either three hours or a full day to try to understand each other beyond difference, beyond stereotypes seeing if they can find common ground. We have a variety of workshops that are more skills oriented. So skills for bridging the political divide, a workshop on how to depolarize oneself um, so that we don't demonize others and how to intervene in conversations with like-minded people when those conversations veer into demonizing and stereotyping the 70 million others. Uh, we have this workshop on families and politics that I talked about. We have one-to-one -one conversations that are done in a brave range of way between reds and blues, rural, urban, and we have people of color and white people, two uh, structured one-hour conversations where people explore um, their life experiences, what they have in common, and where they differ. And we have a marvelous uh, a debate series um, uh, where we sometimes have you know hundreds and hundreds of people in national and local debates. Uh, the debates are on political topics and issues. They are not about winning and losing, but trying to see where we differ and where we might be able to come together. Uh, so lots, and, and in Braver Angels, um, all of our leadership is half red, half blue uh, by, by charter. Um, um, and this, this is kind of a crucible for the country now because um, we have to make decisions together, um, reds and blues together. Uh, and that's been some of the, the, the secret sauce in what we do. So I wanna give you a sense, uh, just as I showed you the mother-daughter pair, uh, I wanna show you um, a, um, uh, about an eight minute clip from uh, Van Jones of CNN, uh, who uh, went and, and observed uh, one of what we call our red blue workshops. Um, and so you'll get a sense of what one of those workshops looks like uh, you'll see the moderators, you'll see people who, um, uh, you'll see the participants. And now I'm gonna find, as I said, on, on this, you have to go back to, there we go, okay. Oops. So what happened here, I wonder? I'm gonna try it once more. And uh, doesn't, okay. Okay, and maybe this will help. Maybe this will work now. Okay. We saw politicians acting like preschoolers again, a meeting that was supposed to be about Syria turned into another instance of name calling and finger pointing. And what's worse, this behavior is being mirrored by regular people all across the country. Liberals and conservatives can't talk to each other anymore. It's tearing up friendships and families. I recently found though a group that's trying to heal this division. It's called Better Angels. And since, since 2016, they've been hosting. Oops, sorry about that. Ah, there we go. We saw politicians acting like preschoolers again, a meeting that was supposed to be about Syria 
turn into another instance of name calling and finger pointing. And what's worse, this behavior is being mirrored by regular people all across the country. Liberals and conservatives can't talk to each other anymore. It's tearing up friendships and families. I recently found though a group that's trying to heal this division. It's called Better Angels. And since, since 2016, they've been hosting workshops all over the country, bringing folks together to find common ground. I went to one of their red blue workshops last weekend in Evanston, Illinois. Take a look. So the goals are more understanding, seeing if there's something in common. Here's something special. Conservatives and liberals okay. sitting side by side, talking, smiling, actually listening to each other. Hamilton Chang here as a red, I'm coming here out of frustration in some ways because I feel like, you know, we've been excommunicated from a lot of our friends in the last couple of years, and it makes me sad. They're here for a workshop put on by the Better Angels group. Their goal is to help bridge the divide among liberals and conservatives, and some community members have come to watch. I'm Drew Morrison. Uh, I came here as a blue today. We need to be able to have real constructive dialogue among each other, even among issues that's, um, that we may disagree on. Now, they split up into reds and blues, reds for conservative, blue for liberal, and they discuss the stereotypes they think the other side believes about them. Judgmental. Judgmental. Anti-religion. And are there any grains of truth to these perceptions? Hyper PC. Okay, so what is true here? We attack people for saying the words rather than attacking the words themselves. Is there a kernel of truth in the, the stereotype that the Reds are closed minded, intolerant? There are principles that right, I stand by. It may look intolerant in some ways but abiding by the rule of law with respect to immigration, abiding by the rule of law for things like that, it looks intolerant. Both say they're surprised by what they hear from the other side. A lot of Reds recognize that they're, you know, the descendants of immigrants and they're pro-immigration. A lot of ink and TV airtime has been spilled on some of the sensational and very dramatic um, things that have been occurring at the border. Um, and that really obscures, I think, the um, more nuanced conversation mm -hmm. of a nation having control of its borders and uh, welcoming immigrants, but doing it through um, through appropriate um, channels and means. What really struck me was the when Larry said, we believe in science and we want to use science to solve issues such as climate rather than rushing to a sweeping government program, <laughs> which is like we recognize for ourselves, oh yeah, we do kind of do that. And you said, yeah, you do that. <laughs> and I was struck about how the other side has principles that they live by. And we have principles too. And it seems like we both get into trouble when we have absolutes. The liberals are then asked to sit in the middle of the group and talk about why they think progressive ideas are the best to resolve America's problems. As they answer, the conservatives are allowed only to listen, no rebuttals, no interruptions. I think that inequality um, causes some people to feel like burn it all down. I don't want to burn it all down. So I think, frankly, in the interest of preserving capitalism, we need to engage in, uh, as you say, leveling the playing field, redistribution, giving people a stake in the system. Blue values in terms of being accepting and open to very diverse points of view or open to open-minded about moral values, right? Like, so same-sex marriage, sexual orientation, gender fluidity, these things um, I think are good for the United States because they're acknowledging and giving a voice and including groups that have been historically marginalized, have had no voice. What are your reservations or concerns about your own side, about the blue side? Some of my experiences have been that in a lot of cases, if you don't um, adhere to every single value or every single position, then you're margin then you're marginalized or you're seen as sort of betraying, sort of betraying the cause in a way. Yeah. I agree that words matter and that words can hurt. But I see arguments being shut down. I see people not being allowed to speak. Next, it's the conservatives turn. I think what's great about the red vision is it emphasizes personal freedoms. And um, I think that in order for people to soar to great heights, uh, maximization in personal freedoms is, is partially responsible. The ability to progress and allow a society to reach 
and people within the society, individuals, to achieve the most that they can achieve with the least amount of interference from outside. So me, it's a positive thing. What are your reservations or concerns about your own side? I think with uh, personal responsibility, personal freedoms, there will be people who are lost. I think it's a harsh truth. We lose our messaging and we lose our principle of caring and compassion by saying, hey, free market, right? Sink or swim. We have to acknowledge that people sink and make sure that we take care of those people. At the end of the day, everybody said this experience is going to impact their personal interactions with people on a day-to-day -day basis. It's just great to like hear reasonable conservative voices in the room. And then when I'm in my friend group, that's very sorted and people make some extreme comments about all those people, I can say, well, not all those people. Come on, let's just, you know, pull back. Same, but <laughs> being that ambassador, we've started out with why, why are we here? And I had said something and basically to the extent of right, being excommunicated from some of my friends friends for many many years friends that i love um so i have twice on the phone calls you know, absolutely listening versus talking my takeaway is that neither side is a monolith that there's a recognition that these are thorny problems that we're trying to address and that they're going to be some very nuanced solutions to those problems. So you were an observer uh, the whole time. You, you were taking like copious notes. What do you think would happen if stuff like this was going on all across the country? So whether it's like a weekend where like a like hundred thousand of these things went down, what do you think would happen in America? I think people would be better equipped to have these sorts of conversations and think in terms of working together towards solutions to problems uh, rather than seeing uh, the other side is just a barrier to progress. We got to know each other a little bit better as people. What is causing you to want to be this deeply involved, I guess, by far as It's about relationships. I'm a physician, I'm a parent, I'm a spouse, I'm a daughter, I'm a friend. All of our relationships are built on communication and we do it very poorly and we're getting worse and worse at it. We can disagree on religion, right? Heaven or hell. And yet for some reason, we're at a point in time in history in this country where you can't disagree about policy. Do you feel like you learned anything today that might help you bridge that gap? Absolutely. To be able to hear, uh, try to be as non-judgmental as possible, right? But just to try and pay attention and try to listen as opposed to trying to prove or defend. Um, it was just a good exercise. One woman said the experience made her more comfortable sharing her voice as a conservative who lives in a liberal town. I was apprehensive about coming because um, sometimes um, today I don't feel like maybe uh, being a conservative or having a conservative voice um, is PC. And so um, I think maybe there were a lot of people out there that um, maybe have this point of view, but they're not really saying it. I really believe if groups like this could get together, take the next step, talk about issues, and sit down and hash it out, I really think we could come up with some solutions, and we may even do a better job than, than uh, some of our politicians. You couldn't do worse. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay. So just to um, finish up here, <clears throat> if you're interested in uh, getting involved with Braver Angels, um, you can go to braverangels.org. You can get on the mailing list. You can also become a member. We'd love to have you as a member for $12 a year. Um, and I'd encourage you then uh, on the on that website, there's these workshops that all of them are online now, as well as in person. Some of them are national, some of them are local. We have alliances, 100 alliances around the country where people who are, go to the initial workshops then who want to continue the conversation and continue to work on depolarizing uh, 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 join alliances. And uh, <clears throat> we, we train um, moderators to do these workshops. Uh, you saw the red blue, there's lots of other kinds of workshops. And from the beginning, we had um, a, a model for this where we decided that um, every everything we do will be free, no, no fee, no charge, and that the training of the moderators would also be free. It's online. 
Uh, and then there's, uh, you know, there's in-person uh, or online follow-up and help. Uh, so uh, the moderator training is free and all the workshops are free. And then, you know, we rely on membership uh, contributions and fundraising. And our fundraising, we try to raise funds from both red and blue uh, sources, uh, always trying to maintain that balance. So um, I think that is my that is my presentation here. So now we have some time for questions and I hope some have come in and um, back to you, Joe. Thank you, Dr. Doherty. I've, I've opened up the chat again. Thank you all for bearing with us. It's a little outside of our usual process. Um, we wanted to run, wanted things to run smoothly for Dr. Doherty here. So thank you all for, for bearing with us. It's now open again. And if you could send your questions to the Q&A box, um, Dr. Doherty, we'll get right into it. Tanitha says, what do you think are the implications for research on this issue? And what do you think we need to do more research on? Well, uh, there, um, there are implications for, of course, research that political scientists are doing uh, on polarization. I can tell you that we are um, involved in uh, now incorporating with research on Brave Angels workshops. And the first randomized controlled trial <clears throat> of the workshop you saw uh, is about to be submitted for publication. A group of six academics uh, did, and I'm pleased that the results were positive. So we need to know <clears throat> about what it takes <clears throat> to help people uh, come to see others in less stereotypical ways and how they develop skills in navigating these differences. So lots of, lots of scholarly and research opportunities um, in, in this area. Thank you. Um... Doug says, is there any involvement in Canadian political context? Seems like there are similarities in the polarization here too. There was a word I missed. Any, uh, say that there's a word I missed there about, say, say it again, please. Is there any involvement in Canadian political Canadian, context? Canadian, okay. Um, interesting, now these, these issues are similar and we've been contacted by folks in Canada uh, are, you know, what, what we do can be uh, applied in other environments. Uh, and uh, we've had some moderators who were trained uh, uh, in, you know, in our, our work who then are applying it in other places. So our, our, our focus in, in Braver Angels is on the United States, uh, but uh, what we've learned and what we've developed, we're, we're happy to share. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Doug. Glad to have you join us from north of the border. Julie asks, in regard to the, the red-blue dichotomy, are the Reds here actually Trump supporters or just conservatives who may not have actually supported Trump? Um, if you ask me about, uh, the very, the, you know, about our workshops in general, I don't know about that particular one. It's a combination. It's a combination. Uh, we have, um, I, I know the leaders, um, so I can think of four leaders in Braver Angels who I interact with regularly. Uh, who uh, voted for Trump twice. Um, and then I know other uh, red leaders. And again, these are the people I deal with the most uh, who voted for third parties and did not vote for Trump. Uh, so, uh, so, but I would like to, <clears throat> uh, I, I would like to avoid any notion <clears throat> that only non-Trump supporters come to our workshops because that is, that is not the case. Great, thank you. And thank you for your question, Julie. Uh, Andrew had one come in here just now. Um, how do you evaluate between a lack of differentiation leading to discord versus someone feeling genuinely unsafe because of the perception that they're endangered by policies supported by their family member? Yeah, so there's um, this is a really important question. Um, I, I can feel unsafe and uh, others I love feel unsafe because of the policies. Uh, that's different than whether I feel unsafe with this family member. Now, if this family member is, uh, is uh, being aggressive with me and putting me down, well, that's a whole other thing. But once we start, in my opinion, <clears throat> start to say that we will not relate to loved ones because of policies they hold that we think are going to be detrimental to my group and other groups, I think we, we're on a slippery slope there. I think we're on a very slippery slope. Um, so I just think, uh, the, the, for me, the differentiation means that I don't cut off, nor do I come on strong to, to tell them they must change a loved one because of their particular 
believes. Now, you could ask me, you could stretch it. You have the neo-Nazi, you know, and all that. You know, th there, are, there are stretches out there. But even there, if I have a nephew who's a neo-Nazi, I'm not going to not invite him to Thanksgiving. Now, I'm not going to let him parade his ideas at Thanksgiving. But I'm not going to not invite him to Thanksgiving. And maybe I'm going to take him aside at some point and say, tell me what's going on. So um, that's, that's my response, separating the person from their beliefs, because it's a slippery slope. And see, both sides do it, because there are people, I'm just going to assume the person asked the question, maybe on the blue or left side, the people on the right who believe <clears throat> that blue or liberal perspectives are ultimately, maybe not tomorrow, but ultimately going to take away freedoms in this country, freedom of religion, for example. So what goes around comes around, because somebody could view your view about the government supporting certain liberties uh, as ultimately taking away something that's very sacred to them and that is the religious freedom. And then they cut you off. So for me, those are, those are important distinctions. I'm glad you asked the question. Yes, thank you for your question. Um, Denise says, I think cultural identity could be a differentiation issue. In other words, historically marginalized people may want to be seen as American, yet in order to do so, they've had to change society versus just changing themselves. For example, being of color in America does not mean you can eliminate political conversations. It's not possible because the toxic experience of race in this country has been tied up with, you know, legally, historically, et cetera. Um, just a comment to offer. Thank you for that. Thank you for per per perceptive comment. Yep. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. And let's see. Um, Jessica has a great question. How do outright lies and misinformation by media platforms factor in when trying to bridge the gap of polarization? Absolutely, they factor in. So we'll probably make this the last one. Absolutely, they factor in. <clears throat> when you bring people together <clears throat> and they try to reason together, you get almost everybody saying that they are troubled by the, the influence of the media uh, and that they're aware that they can, we can all be in bubbles. Uh, and the, the last thing I'll say on this is that part of what we teach, what we teach about skills and so on, is that <clears throat> facts ultimately depend on who we trust as authorities. And so facts are contested in part because we don't trust the same, we don't trust sources of information. Uh, and then we, we pound each other with facts that are from our side. Now, do I believe, of course, that some things are more true than others? Yes. But the, the fact, different fact universes are an issue when you bring people together in the kind of settings we do, with the kind of containers we have, then people will talk about being troubled by exactly what this questioner is asking about. So thank you. Well, thank you. Um, that is our time for this month. We, on behalf of the Center for Practice Transformation, we'd love to thank you all for taking the time to join us. And we'd like to extend um, today's presenter Dr. Dr. Bill Doherty, an extra special thanks. Thank you all. Have a great weekend and we hope to see you next month. Okay, it's been my pleasure. And a pleasure having you here, Bill. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, if Bill has just a few extra minutes here, correct? If, if you wanna read the weekend or, or submit something through the chat, if you'd like to speak to Dr. Doherty, um, on, on microphone via audio, just raise your hand and uh, I'll give you that, those options, accessibility, privileges, sorry. <laughs> it's Friday, we're all getting there, right? This is sort of like the encore of the presentation, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was actually familiar with that piece and had heard about your organization um, at some point in the last few years. Um, that was, I, I had seen that clip before actually, so it was, that was cool. That was cool. You know, we had one comment come in here um, that I, I wanted to share from David. David shared, and earlier on in your presentation, Bill, I love getting rid of those toxic relationship, relationships. Left over 300 quote unquote friends on social media, including siblings. Saves me a ton on not getting gifts at Christmas. I love that I don't have to hear their drama anymore. And now my health is better. Um, thank you for your enthusiasm, David. Um, I know that's probably not what you're what you're uh, going for, Bill. But well, I'm glad David said it. It's it's um, not many people believe that. You know, in relate. Let me just say, <clears throat> I'm a family therapist in part because I think family relationships are not <clears throat> even close to the same as Facebook friends. Uh, and um, 
And when one of those siblings is in a terrible accident, gets cancer, um, is, um, is disabled. Uh, when a parent who we say, I'm tired of dealing with that. <clears throat> when that person is, on, is, is in great need or on their deathbed. Um, well, that's, that I would just say that's a whole other issue. So I, um, uh, I, um, I, 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 everybody makes their own decisions here, but I think for me, the, the bar of <coughs> exiting, <coughs> exiting a family relationship, the people that we grew up with, the people we spend Thanksgiving with, the people who are part of that convoy of ours in our life, the bar for me is extremely, extremely high. And it's not about what their political views are. So, Bill, there was another question here that um, that didn't get answered. It says, uh, "Do you have any advice in terms of helping clients manage the general stress and anxiety the heightened polarization of our larger society has brought on?" Yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah, I, there's the coping stress and coping literature talks about a passive coping and active coping, <clears throat> excuse me. So the <clears throat> passive coping, and it applies to political stress like any other stress, <clears throat> are things like reducing uh, our exposure. <clears throat> so you don't have to be watching your favorite TV show every day, <clears throat> your news channels. Um, uh, so reducing exposure, limiting certain kinds of conversations, limiting conversations with certain people who, who are stressful for you. <clears throat> making sure you get enough sleep, uh, keeping your eyes on a larger prize in terms of, 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 of your core relationships. And then the active coping, <clears throat> I think of it as, as um, how do we enact our values in the world? So that's what I encourage clients to do when they are troubled by these things. <clears throat> What's important to you? What, 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 what kind of world do you want us to have? And then what could you do? Some small thing, a middle-sized thing, you know, large thing if you want. What could you do uh, to enact your values? So after the 2016 election, uh, I, I know a woman who decided <clears throat> that uh, when she was in the parking lot at Target and she saw people who in our community uh, seemed to look like African immigrants, uh, Somalis and others, and you could tell from dress and so on, um, that she would deliberately smile and say hello uh, because she had reason to believe that these folks were wondering about whether they were welcome. Uh, that's an example of some active coping, enacting your values in the world. Other people join political campaigns. Some, some of us get in braver angels work. So, uh, so um, limiting exposure, you know, get, get, keep staying healthy in that way, and then enacting our values in the world, I think are the two biggest ways to cope with political stress. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up, Peter. And thank you all for your questions so far. They've all been great. Um, yes, Dr. Doherty's slides will be made available. They will be attached to this afternoon's email. And Bill, did you have did you have a slide where you were sharing your email address as contact information? Yeah, that was the first one. Could you pull that up for us again here? Yeah. Well, uh, do you want to just put it in? Yeah, uh, I can add it. I can add it to the Yeah, so B Doherty at umn.edu. So B D O H E R T Y at umn.edu. Yeah, I just dropped it in the chat box for everyone. So one thing that didn't come up that I can just mention <clears throat> is a lot of people wonder about <clears throat> involvement of political leaders in this work. And so after four years now, we're getting more interest from political leaders. So I've, I've done workshops in Minnesota with uh, legislators, uh, both uh, conservative and liberal legislators. Um, we're doing uh, workshops with county commissioners. <clears throat> we did a workshop for congressional staff members of, of uh, Representative Dean Phillips and Representative Pete Starber, a Democrat Republican. And right now we're in the getting really close to finalizing some Capitol Hill uh, workshops um, with um, not quite clear yet whether it's going to be the staffers at this point of members of Congress or some of the members of Congress themselves. Um, but we've got somebody who has connections on Capitol Hill. Um, uh, who is uh, helping to set those up. So we're getting, we're starting to get some traction at those levels. We're also getting companies. <clears throat> so we've done some presentations for target employees uh, around the country, you know, 5,000 people on a, on a webinar about dealing with political differences. Um, so uh, we're, we're getting some traction now <clears throat> from institutions uh, in the country as well. 
Thank you. Thank you, Bill. I know we want to watch your time. One more great question came in from Doug here in the Q&A. Do you have time for one more and then we'll... Yep. Um, Doug says, I'm curious about alternative political perspectives that don't fit the red-blue dichotomy, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. such as a neutral position and how mm -hmm. that adds to the layers of conflict. Have there been any issues on this front? Perhaps... Yes. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So <clears throat> we talk about red-blue, but anybody is welcome in Brave Angels. The only workshop we have where you have to declare red or blue is the one you observe here, the red blue workshop, because of the nature of the design of that workshop. Uh, all of our other workshops, you can be red, blue, purple, teal, whatever. Um, and so um, we, don't, we don't exclude people there. The other thing I wanna say though, is that the political science is really clear on this, that the great, great majority, 95% or more of people who pay attention to politics who would, and who would be interested in like a Brave Angels workshop uh, have a more conservative and more liberal lean. That there are precious few, maybe somebody's out there, true independent who vote differently each time. They don't lean conservative, they don't lean liberal. Most people who pay attention have a lean towards red, lean towards blue. But if they don't, they're also welcome, except in this one particular workshop that can come and observe. But in all of our other workshops, they just join right in. Sure, sure. Doug went on to say, I guess what I wonder about is I feel like I'm in the middle ground and I'm not really a fan of any of the parties and their positions, but I see some of the philosophical values they may have. I feel you, Doug. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, um, and you know, I'd love to have you join us. Well, great. Thank you, Dr. Doherty. Okay, I you're go. welcome. We'd love to have you back. Thank you for sharing your time with us. Everyone, be well, be kind, and we hope to see you next month. Okay. Thank you for having me here. Bye-bye. Okay. Peter, thank you, buddy. You're welcome.